Derek Wheatley and welcome to episode 193 of the Weekly Weekly Podcast. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. A um, uh, big thank you to David for joining us last week. A lot of talk about, um, uh, well, obviously to do with poetry, but the stuff that he, he went through with regards to his the congenital genital heart defect that he had, um, he was born with, and then the pacemaker and the COVID, and it was quite a journey, but... Um, absolutely uh what a very nice fella and uh if you haven't listened to that do go back and listen to it i've been told i need to get better at this part in particular okay so support us and buy me a coffee if you like the podcast okay um i i'm apparently putting across a negative vibe but i read this out because i'm not quite comfortable with it but look if you want to support us do and if you don't that's all right too but the link is in the description uh, anyway, my guest this week is a psychotherapist and a mental health blogger, and his name is Nick Groom. How are you doing, Nick? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. You're more than welcome. Um, before I ask you the first question, and we just we touched on this a little bit, film posters behind you, perfect addition to the podcast. It It, it is. We've got um, Vertigo and West Side Story. I'm not sure how the two mix. But, <laughs> um, I suppose the posters are still red. Um, and then we've got Bobby Moore in the corner, of course. Of course, um, I that was very uh, remiss of me to to not mention Bobby Moore, of course. But I suppose with the with the film connections, it's it's always good. Nick, we'll we'll start where we always do. Um, could you give us a short history of your upbringing, please? Um, yeah, as you can tell by my accent, although I live in Ballina, um, I'm not originally from Ballina. Uh, grew up in South London, um, and moved around a little bit, um, mostly because of my dad's work and things like that so um lived in a couple of places in south london um and then moved up to shropshire which is kind of like on the midlands wales border in, in england um and then moved into wales as well um where i went to school um up in wrexham in north wales um i then carried on moving i suppose never really settled and um went to university in um birmingham uh, and lived the sort of the remainder of my life, and say the remainder of my life, but you know, um, in Birmingham, and then moved over to Ireland in 1999. So, although I'm still technically a blow in, I suppose, um, I've been here about 24 years now. Quite a bit of moving, all right. It's a bit di- dipping in and out of countries. I think I need to take that one to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? And that's the connection there with um, with West Ham United. Then I guess it well, it it is. I mean, West Ham is um, East London. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad is from East London, or he was from East London. He died in twenty eighteen, um, but he was from East London. So it was kind of like a he would have supported West Ham. His dad would have supported West Ham. His uncles, his brother. So it's very much sort of like a, a family thing. Um, myself and my brother support West Ham. Um, my sister, if I remember rightly, supports Tottenham, um, which unfortunately, um, so does my youngest son. He's a he's an avid Spurs supporter. Um, but you know, we get it, at least at least, and this is where everybody switches off. At least it's not Man United. Yeah, th- like my dad is a Spurs fan. Okay. Um, I'm an Arsenal fan. Oh, and wow. I've got two brothers and they're Blackburn and Aston Villa. It's a, it's quite a, a collection of, and I've learned, like when you were mentioned uh, Shropshire uh, and uh, South London and Birmingham, and I learned all my English geography from football, like from the kind of traveling around the maps and, and, and now it's from true crime stuff as well. Cause I, I do like listening to true crime stuff. And I feel like, you know, they always give you where it was and all that. And I've, I've become quite um, uh, more aware of the, the, the English landscape <laughs> through that kind of thing. I, th- I think a lot said with football in the UK, it's, I suppose a big part of it is where, you know, where do you come from? Mm-hmm. There is allegiance. But I think, you know, with a lot of cases, it's what team speaks to me. Yeah. I, I suppose, you know, if, if from where I was born, I should have been either, I don't know, either Crystal Palace or Charlton or something like that, you know, but um, I went with West Ham. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, with a lot of people, it's some, probably more of an emotional connection rather than, a, you know, I was born and raised there type of thing. Yeah, that, I, I agree with that as well. Um, so, uh, Nick, another question we always ask as well is, um, when did you first become aware of mental health? Um, I suppose in terms of my own mental health, um, it would have been 
around about 18 years ago. Okay. Like that, um, when I started to realize that my mental health was starting to suffer. Um, I, th I think a big part of it was because I had blocked out, which I think a lot of people do is, you know, you mask what is going on um, and you almost do the opposite of what you really need. So I think a lot of it would have been, certainly in the UK, I would have been working in the pub industry. So I would have run pubs, I would have worked for a brewery, you know, so there was that kind of almost very sort of macho drinking culture, um, you know, that you had to sort of buy into, which, which suited me because it, it blocked out a lot of the, the emotional pain that, you know, that I was suffering um, and that I came to realize that I was actually suffering from certainly, you know, with childhood trauma um, and things like that. So, you know, did this kind of play hard, work hard mentality suited me um, because it, it blocked out the pain that I was feeling. The, the whole thing of that, like, and I think it's, across Ireland and Britain and well I suppose many countries but the whole culture of like the drinking culture and one of the things that would have I would have noticed with my own mental health was I was doing it more and more I was drinking more and more in my early 20s and like you're saying there I didn't quite know that I was blocking anything out or that I was trying to you know dis disguise someone or uh, something or shape it into something else until I stopped drinking and then it became this thing that just kind of came at me um, and I guess, like, did you have that kind of uh, revelation yourself? Was it was it slightly different for you? It it, it was slightly different because um, I was working with a, um, a social outreach pro project, um, which was a mental health one. And um, it, it was, I wouldn't say it was triggering, but mm. the people that I was kind of like working with, supporting with the a lot of the, the topics that we were covering, I remember one day thinking, you know, my God, here I am. And we would be going around into schools and things like that with TY about, you know, mental health. And people were talking about their own mental health issues, their own uh, traumas. And I suppose I felt a bit of a fraud because here I was encouraging people to speak out, encouraging people to seek help if they had, um, you know, um, poor mental health. And I was doing nothing about it. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was kind of like the big um, light bulb moment um, where I suppose I was being, I started to become authentic towards myself and honest with myself, you know, and that is a big thing. I think, you know, it's very, very difficult to be honest with yourself and to say, yeah, I do need help. Things aren't right because... I think culturally, there's still this, you've got to man up, you've got to suck it up and get on with it. And, uh, you know, that those kind of messages that we do get. So it is very difficult to actually break through that and say, no, I do need help. Uh, like we talked about on the show about that idea of, you know, people who are maybe struggling and, and maybe afraid to admit that they need it. Like when, when you went for help the first time, how did you find it? Um, I, I, I was scared stiff because I had no idea how to actually get the help that I've, you know, I, and it, I suppose it came from, I knew I needed help, but I hadn't got the language to articulate what it was that I needed help with. I, you know, I felt a mess, um, but I just could not find the words to say, I'm feeling a mess and this is how it feels like, and this is why I am feeling a mess. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that was a very um, a very very difficult um, thing to actually navigate around, um, and then the the whole big thing of picking up the phone. Um, I, I mean, I literally had a list of numbers of counsellors. I had never been into counselling at all, um, and I thought, okay, I'll just start at the top and work my way down. Um, so that you know that really took it out of me. It's it's like terrifying uh, pretty much sums up my experiences because um, like you said there, I, I was going in with the impression of like knowing that I needed the help, but having no 
didn't have the language to express what I was trying to, what, what I needed to, to, uh, to get from the person. And when you're like, you know, say if it's for me, it was depression and anxiety was the eventual diagnosis, but uh, like, I didn't know that's what it was. So like, how do you describe anxiety if you don't know what it is like, because you and I both know that anxiety and nervousness are, you know, different things and, and like depression and sadness are different things. And if you haven't experienced it, like my first, you said you, you first experience uh, your first, your own experience of mental health was 18 years ago. Like mine was when I was 27. So like I didn't know before that I had no language for it. It's a it's a daunting thing when you go into someone who's a professional at something, but you can't even tell them what you need. Exactly. Mm. exactly. Um, and you know, I I would have clients who know that they need the help, have the courage. You know, and I think that's something that we underestimate mm -hmm. is the courage that it takes to to actually go to to talk to somebody. Um, so I would have clients who know that they want to. This has to change. This doesn't feel right. But they don't have, even in the therapy session, they don't always have the language to say, okay, I either, this is how I'm feeling, or even this is what I want to achieve. It's just, you know, ah, help me. You know, and, and in that case, uh, I would sort of, sometimes I would get them to draw what they're feeling. Because it is, you know, a lot of it is pre-verbal. We don't have... The, the vocabulary to say, this is what is going on for me. So, you know, drawing can be very, very powerful. So that would be one way um, that when a client comes, you know, and it's just sort of clear that they don't have that language, that I would say to them, okay, here's a pad, pen, you know, colors, or even um, modeling clay or something like that, and say, just draw, you know, what it is that is going on for you. And that it can be very, very, very therapeutic for the individual. And also it gives them a voice. Mm. So often, you know, with our mental health issues, we do not have the voice to say because we don't have the language. So, you know, we're not heard. So to, to be able to express themselves, whether it is on drawing, is a tremendous thing because they feel that they've been heard. Uh, so speaking of kind of, you know, being heard and, and finding the, the the language. When and and why did you start blogging about mental health? Um, I started. Ooh, um, I suppose about ten or fifteen years ago. I, I I started blogging about mental health, and then it kind of like morphed it when I had a cancer diagnosis into blogging, and it was more tweeting um, about you know cancer and mental health, and I did that under another name altogether. Um, but I think a lot of it was that I wanted or I felt that if I was to talk about what was going on for me and my mental health journey, it might empower somebody. It might, it, to use the phrase, it might give somebody the permission to say, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can go and do something about it. Because I think we can talk and listen to, you know, the academic, the clinical phraseology and this is what you need to do but that doesn't really connect all the time it's when we actually hear somebody say this is what happened to me this is how I went about and this is how I am dealing with it I think is far more um resonates more with us because it's real you know there's this person who is saying yeah I know what you're saying you know I, I totally get what it where it is you're coming from because you know, me too. That's how this, uh, some people will know this, but that's how this uh, podcast started because I, I was blogging a little bit, like whatever it was, three or four years ago. And a lot of the gym people that I see, you know, day to day, day to day kind of uh, started kind of, you know, being positive towards it. And, and uh, like you said, like a couple of people coming to you and saying, I kind of had this feeling and they might've been talking about anxiety and maybe not have the words. And it, it is very like, the more I see and the more I talk about it, um, the more amazing it becomes as like the community that people are putting out there with that with regards to blogging and stuff and regards to like you mentioned drawing, but my friends and our therapist that there's a sand play therapist they had on there. There's so many different forms of therapy that people can, you know, go in and maybe feel 
like that's great what you said about the drawing because I think that people will immediately think right I have to go in here and talk and what am I going to say but but that you know sound play or or art and all those kind of expressive things with creativity 50% of the people going might want that yeah 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 absolutely and I think as well you know I think as therapists we're all guilty of using the big phrases you know and <laughs> This is my approach to therapy and it's this, that and the other. And if you were to go on, say, the IACP website and look up a therapist with their approach, I, I remember, and this is coming from my own stuff, when I first started looking for a therapist, I thought, what the hell does all of this mean? You know, yeah. I was yeah, a dictionary or Google. Well, you know, you know, the, the simple things like humanistic. Does this mean, you know, it's like a humanist approach? They go, are they agnostic, atheist? You know, what does this mean? So I think, you know, for us as therapists, we need to be aware of people who are coming to us um, and, and, you know, simplify it without dumbing it down totally, you know, but sort of simplify it to take that fear away. Because I know that when I was going and looking for therapists, I just thought, I have no idea what, what this is all about, you know? Yeah. And we don't have, we're not taught in schools, this is what to expect. We're not even taught really about mental health, um, you know, but certainly not, okay, if you need help, this is what happens in a therapy session or a counselling session. So we've got, we've got no point of reference. So when we're bombarded with this list of, um, you know, Rogerian, humanistic, whatever it might be, it's, oh, my God, all I want is someone to bloody tell me where I'm going. Yeah. um, Like, obviously, this is something that's very difficult for, for you to talk about. And, and I guess for people like who have experienced it to, to talk about and to listen to and these kind of triggering kind of moments. But um, if someone is is abused in their formative years, for instance, um, you talked about blocking it out. And I think, you know, that's kind of one thing that people will will do, um, obviously to a negative, you know, outcome. Um, how did you, you know, start to open up about it and and like, you know, come to terms with it? I guess. I, I suppose, as I was just saying, that the the reason why I started was I, I felt shame and guilt. Mm. You know that I, I was saying to people, you need to talk about um your own mental health. You need to what's the phrase it's okay not to be okay or whatever it is or it's okay to talk you know and yet I was not doing any of these things so I thought Jesus you know I'm right bloody hypocrite here um because I, I'm not doing any of this so that is that that's what got me into it but I think when we're dealing with trauma and just on the whole point of trauma is that you know, trauma doesn't necessarily mean sexual abuse. Um, trauma can be um, physical abuse. It can be emotional abuse. And a lot of the um, the issues that we uh, we carry with us in later life, you know, are pretty much the same. A abuse is abuse. And it is about the message that we received through that abuse. You know, whether it is that I'm not any good, I'm useless, um, or, you know, I, I'm um, all, all I'm worth doing is to be used and for people to, you know, so it's it's those kind of messages that we receive that if we don't get help, they carry on and they evolve and they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And that that is very, very difficult. That that old sense of like almost being beaten down by are beaten down at such an early age. I think that's the kind of sad thing that you hear about a lot of people, whether it's like you said, like it's, a, it could be at home it could be at school. It could be in the playground. It's all, all the stuff that can damage us so much when we are young and to get like, to get through the adult stuff is hard enough, but then to go back to kind of the, when we're, we're young, young person stuff, it's difficult. When I was, um, uh, I was diagnosed as a, a bipolar two about, but six years after I was diagnosed with depression and it was certain things led to it and we were kind of trying to figure it out and stuff like that. And you mentioned to me B, uh, BPD. Um, can you explain what that is for people who might not know? Um, BPD, I suppose, is the, the American term, borderline personality disorder. I think in Europe, it's more emotionally unstable personality disorder. Um, 
I think BPD doesn't really help because it sounds as if I haven't got a personality or the personality that I have is somehow, you know, disordered or it can't make its mind up. Um, that was a BPD, EUPD was um, a diagnosis I received um, way back. Um, I suppose the characteristics of it really are, um, before I go into the characteristics, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd say that the BPD for, or EUPD for me really just lists our behaviours. It doesn't it ask the question why. Um, you know, it just sort of presents these these behaviours. And if, if anyone was to Google it, um, there are some horrific um, articles about people with BPD. There are YouTube channels which totally, um, you know, destroy people. It's used in terms of an uh, insult. Um, you know, at some stage, I think they were saying, you know, does um, Donald Trump have personality disorder? You know, so it, it, it's when people are using that, you know, to remember, how does that actually make the individual who has a diagnosis of that feel? In terms of myself, um, it, it was something very, very scary. Um, I mean, just to sort of run down the 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 behaviours, if you like, that accompany BPD, it's um, there's a huge fear of abandonment. So, um, you know, if I form a very strong relationship, and it doesn't have to be a sexual relationship, it can be just a relationship, then I will worry, more than worry, actually, it's, it's just an overriding fear that this person is going to abandon me. So what we do is, and this is why sometimes we're called manipulative, you know, it would be a case of um, anything I can do for you. I'm going to do everything mm -hmm. for you. Absolutely brilliant. You know, just to prevent that person um, from leaving. Now, you know, the chances are the person isn't going to leave. They're quite happy. Um, but within us, we have this overriding fear of abandonment. There's also really intense emotional feelings. So, and that can swing from one extreme to the other. So, you know, now I could be quite happy. Then two minutes down the line, I'm just overwhelmingly sad. Um, the, it, very impulsive, you know. Um, and I think I, when I first went into therapy, I thought, right, okay, what I want to do is I want to help other people who were sexually abused as children. So I went to look at starting up a support group because there was nothing in the west of Ireland um, like that. So I thought, okay, to get this out, I'm going to do a radio interview. So the local radio station agreed. And this sounds good. Okay, I'm going to do a radio interview. And um, I remember sitting there waiting for the telephone and thinking, what the hell am I doing? I'm not ready for this. But it's this kind of impulsive, right, that's it. I'm going to do it now type of thing without any, any, um, any thought or reasoning behind it. In a lot of people, there's um, intense anger that can come suddenly, you know, very strongly, um, you know, and that might be as a re reaction of something that is, you know, something totally innocuous that has happened. You know, the, the, the emotional response to, say, somebody close to you dying might well be the same as if I've just dropped a pencil, you know, it's this yeah. ah, type of thing um intense feelings of emptiness you know who who am i what is the point what is the point to me which can lead then to you know suicidal thoughts self-harm thoughts that kind of thing as well as dissociation where it's just a i remember you know years and years ago thinking it was as if an alien was taking over me and doing these things that i had no control Going back to what I was saying about, you know, BPD doesn't talk about the why. I had a very good therapist um, a few years ago who sort of looked at this and said, OK, you know, we went into great, great detail. And um, she said, rather than looking at it as some kind of mental health issue. Or mental illness or a disorder, even let's look at why. Why? Why are you feeling this way? So I was through work in therapy, I was able to sort of kind of like attach it to my own childhood um, experiences. So 
a lot of the um, emotional swaying um, would have been coming from the way that I was brought up. You know, it was very much, there was no kind of like emotional um, calm, if you like. It could be quite swinging from one side to the other. So, so that was my norm. I thought, okay, well, that, that's the way to be. So I kind of adopted um, those behaviours. I started then to see, okay, you know, everything that I'm displaying here under the label of BPD was either learned behaviour or behaviours that I adopted to keep myself safe. So dissociation, you know, the, the mind uses that as a way of, um, as a kind of safety mechanism. When we're in extreme danger or abuse or anything like that, you know, it can be a case that it's so horrible that if the mind stayed with the body, it would just be too overwhelming. So, you know, this is very sort of simplistic, but um, the mind kind of goes off. Although we are physically present, our mind takes us into a different place to protect us. So in later life, if I was feeling threatened, I could dissociate, you know, my mind could go off. Because when we are, when we are, when we do um, go through trauma, it kind of rewires our brain so that it's very difficult to say, okay, what I'm feeling right now might be similar to what I was feeling back then, but it's not the same. It's, it feels the same. Therefore, I need to react in the same way as I did as a kid or whenever it might be. So that's why we sometimes dissociate. So by going through all of that work in therapy, helped me take control of it. You know, think, and understand it. So if I I see it more in lines of PTSD, because with the PTSD, there's a lot of similar in terms of the 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 behaviours and that, and the responses to um, BPD. But with PTSD, there is the trauma that causes it. So I think you know that is big to understand. This is where it does come from. Thanks for that, because I think when we talk to people who have been diagnosed with something, let's say like BPD, like myself, a bipolar, it's that you described it really well about how it's, um, you know, villainized in certain places, different, different disorders. And you can find, like you said, some horrible stuff about bipolar disorder as well. And like uh, when someone comes on and they're open enough to talk about these diagnoses, like it's important for people to hear it from someone who knows what they're talking about. Not, you know, not like some, you know, comic book writer who put it into a character and then they turned it into this famous, you know, villain. And then all of a sudden, well, that must be something to do with villains because one villain in a comic book, you know, it's, it's, it goes around like that. But what I found kind of interesting then when you, you just mentioned it there about, you went then into psychotherapy, like where, like that's a big jump. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I think, you know, look, looking back throughout my life, I've always felt whether whether different is the right word, I don't know, but I've never really felt as if I fitted into whatever else was going on. You know, I mentioned about working in the pub trade. I did it, but it was never really me. You know, I think it, it's, it can be quite sort of Karl Marx, you know, the alienation of the worker to the the, the job that they're doing. Um, so I would have always struggled with that. And I always thought, oh, God, you know, there has to be something that, I can feel is an extension of me that I can connect with that I don't have huge anxiety about from the, the moment I come in from work through to the morning mm -hmm. when I get up to go, you know, and, and it really does take hold. And I know in a lot of cases, you know, my, my mood um, did drop and I did have depression as well. Um, so I was always looking for that, extension of me as you know as a, as a job if you like um and i tried different things um and it never seemed to fit until i thought well hang on a second you know i've been through therapy myself 
I've been running a support group with you know a, a few other therapists. This was before I trained to be a therapist. I'm running a support group for adult survivors of sexual abuse. I've been involved in mental health projects. Why don't I look and see about training to be a therapist? You know, and it was kind of like, you know, why, why didn't I think of this earlier? But I probably wasn't in the right place to, to actually acknowledge that this is what I want to do. So, it, it, and once I made that decision, it was, yes, this is, this is what it's all about. So, you know, that, that there was no kind of, um, uh, you know, I, in school, that's what I wanted to do. I hadn't got a clue. And it probably wasn't until I started training as a therapist um, 10 or more, more than 10 years ago that I suddenly thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. You know, up until then, I hadn't got a clue. I just went from job to job in the hope that I would find the right job. Um, like we're all, well a lot of us are still trying to figure out what we want to do. You know, it's like, it's, it's the bit, it's the age old question. It's one of those ones where you're in school and you're asked like 18, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And you're like, well, what, you know, and you fill out your form and you're, you don't know what you're going to do. But I think like, do you think it makes a difference um, for, for people who would be going to see you um, that they know that you've been through some stuff yourself? It's it, it like, I don't know if it like, this is something that I've talked about before. And I do think it makes a difference. Not that I go into my therapist and say, right, what have you done or what have you been through? But the, the sharing through conversations, it's happened that way. I Yeah, I, I think that that is a very, very kind of fine line to, to walk down because, uh, you know, as a therapist, I'm very much aware of the dynamic of the relationship between myself as a therapist and the client. My primary concern is to hold that safe space for the client to explore the issues that they want to explore. So yes, sometimes a little bit of self-disclosure can help. Other times, you know, and, it, and it's, it, it's about me kind of judging it. Other times I would be aware that this person is so vulnerable at the moment that if I was to share even a little bit about me, that they would want to take care of me, mm -hmm. not the, you know, not me holding the space. But I think as well, you know, it, I know people joke about it, but if we're not careful, um, it can be a little bit like, you know, the, the the client saying, well, you know, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm going through, you know, and it's sort of like almost like a, a comedy sketch of the therapist saying, huh, you think you've got problems, wait till you hear about mine, you know. So it is about the client. Now, Having said that, you know, I've gauged on a couple of occasions, not, not with every single client, to actually say, okay, let's let's just take a stop. Would it be helpful if I told you a little bit about my background um, and why I came into therapy? Because I know as a, as a client that you go in, and maybe this is just me, um, but you know, it's it's kind of like trying to pick holes in the in the therapist. Um, and what do you know? Mm -hmm. huh? You know, you're, you're sat there, all right, mate, but you haven't got the first idea what I'm going through. So sometimes I'm I'm met with that, and I always think it's kind of like um, fate is throwing how I was as a client back at me with with some people that come in, you know. Um, but I can recognise, and if somebody's sort of saying that, well, why are you saying yes? when you have no idea. So by saying, okay, well, let me just very briefly tell you a little bit about me, that might help. So with their agreement, I would. Um, and I wouldn't go into any great detail, um, but I would just say, you know, I would have experienced um, whatever difficulty it might be. And that can help. But we have to be so careful that it doesn't become about us because it's not about us. It is about the client. Yeah, I think that's that. That's obviously the most important thing. And I do get that where I've had different, you know, uh, therapists and different conversations, and and in those ways that like some have felt, you know, it. Not every therapist is going to suit you, and you know, the kind of it's not. 
Yeah. yeah. And I think that whole thing of uh, what I found it in and when I went to the last time I went to therapy was it was very much a kind of uh, kind of there was a openness to him. And he told me a little bit, like like you said, not he didn't go down, you know, all the all the way down the road, you know, but just a little bit around the corner. And I kind of learned something about him, and so and it, it did like relax me a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, so I I know what you mean though, because I I think there is a danger then when everything's been shared by both, and then it it's no longer a therapist session. Then it's just a, a you know an old chat, but like. You you mentioned about your cancer diagnosis that you shared along the way and, and tweeting stuff. But one thing that you pointed out to me when you were talking about it was um, it, it was quite triggering for you. Yeah. And 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 I, th- I think I'm probably still trying to understand. I, I think I can understand it up here, you know, mm-hmm. logically. Um, but it still takes a little bit to of getting used to my God. Yeah, it was triggering. It, it was basically I had throat cancer. This would have been in 2021. Um, and the tumor had got so large that they couldn't operate. Um, there was a danger that, that with radiation therapy, that it would swell and I wouldn't be able to breathe. So they had to stick a tracking tube in, which is the most horrific thing for me anyway to happen. And it, it it sort of stuck stuck out here and it went down and there was a little thing that you had to change every now and again and, and an inner tube and that. Um, but that wasn't enough. What they also decided was that if I was to drink anything, I had to put this stuff like polyfiller in it. So that, because what was happening was that the, the liquid was effectively being diverted by the tumor into my lungs. And then there would have been the chance of pneumonia. So everything had to be quite a thick consistency. So, you know, if probably we don't use it as much now, but wallpaper paste. Mm -hmm. To have a drink of water had to have the consistency of wallpaper paste. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, the last thing that I wanted to do was to drink this stuff. Um. Food had to be not mushed up totally, but it had to be of a certain consistency as well. So I just couldn't be doing with that. So my blood pressure was dropping really, really bad. Um, It did start to affect me emotionally as well. Um, And on a couple of occasions, I had to have radiotherapy every single morning and um, as well as chemo. And on a couple of occasions, I actually sort of passed out. Um, Thankfully in the chair, although I did do it twice um, when I was at home and I temporarily lost my vision as well. So one of the times that I'd passed out, they actually admitted me into Galway. This is in Galway, into Galway Hospital. And the registrar came and she had a chat with me. She said, you know, I've read your file and I see there's a note there that you um, were abused as a child. She said, I think a lot of what is going on is that you're being triggered. So I thought, well, how the hell can having cancer trigger you know, childhood abuse? But the more she went on about it, and the more I thought about it, there is a sense of not being in control. In any kind of abuse, even whether it's child or adult, you know, we don't have control. We feel as if our control has been taken away. So we don't have that control. So this was what was going on. Things were being done to me in the hospital. They were, you know, it was quite invasive as well. You know, they were sticking a tube in. Um, I was told I had to have radiotherapy, chemotherapy. They were forcing me to, to, to drink and eat in a different way. So I was just totally not in control of practically any aspect of my life. So she said that was triggering um, as well as the fact that, you know, you literally do have people prodding that year and um, there is no dignity. So she said all of that was acting as a trigger. At first I thought, ah. but the more I sort of sat with that, the more I thought, my God, yeah, you know, this is 
this is right. And I think that that is the the nature of triggers that a lot, you know, we, we don't sort of realize we expect to be triggered by an event or something happening to us that is exactly the same as the original trauma, but it's not. And going back to what I was saying earlier, it's about that feeling, you know, this feels the same. Mm. And because through the trauma, you know, our brains get rewired, we think this feels the same, therefore it is the same. So, so that was how it was triggering. Um, with regards to the cancer, how are you now? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Great. Um, I still have a, a swelling here, which was the lymphedema, um, because the, the lymph nodes get totally destroyed okay. by radiotherapy. Um, which means that I have to, without grossing everybody out, you know, there, it does the, the, the nutrients and whatever else the, the liquid is that gets passed through the lymph nodes just collates here. But every morning I have to massage it and sort of shift it back out again. Um, but um, yeah, but the, and I still go for, you know, checkups now mm -hmm. and again. Um, and they've got this wonderful device that they shove up your nostril. And it comes back down your your throat without any anaesthetic or loop or anything like that. Um, so that is always something to look forward to. Very much so, I'd imagine. But I'm I'm very glad to hear you're you're doing well now. Um, there's it kind of leads into this uh, uh next question and and something that you'll definitely be able to talk about. Um, the connection, and I don't know if people. Um, are one hundred percent aware of this, or some people obviously are, but the connection between physical and mental health. Yeah, abso absolutely. Um, I think there's many aspects to that. Just sort of sticking with the the, the cancer thing. Um, was it um, Susan Sontag? Uh, she she wrote about how everybody who is born, so every person, is a citizen of the well, citizen of the kingdom of the well, but also we can become citizens of the kingdom of the sick. Mm -hmm. Which, yes, I believe that, but I think where she didn't go was after we have had an illness, you know, a significant illness, we become changed. So I think that that, for me anyways, the third kingdom, is um, that we are in that kingdom of the, of the changed. Mm. Because physically, we can become changed. Now, you know, I can say about this, I still have difficulty swallowing. I can't eat certain things. Um, the love of my life, ice cream and chocolate tastes disgusting now, you know. So oh. I know, I know. Um, so, um, you know, th there is that. But also going through that can be quite traumatic as well. So it does impact our mental health. And as I say, you know, during that time, for the whole of 2021, you know, my, my mood was going up and down um you know and there were times where i was just thinking i just want this to end you know um forget it just just let me go mm -hmm. um but also if so if we are feeling physically unwell it can affect our mood as well now we could you know i dare say there's another three or four podcasts into how that does take effect but I think the danger with that is that, you know, the message that we sometimes get is that, okay, to either stave off depression, for example, or to um, bring our mood back up, we have to be out there, you know, we hear all these people saying, yeah, I do three marathons a week and, you know, depression never came back to me, which is fine for them. You know, it's no, not one size fits all. There are an awful lot of people who, because their mood is so low, thought of even getting off the sofa or out of the bed is in itself a marathon. So again, you know, those kind of messages, and I know, you know, when my mood was low, to hear this, get out and go for a walk in nature, and it's it's fine, but it's not what I wanted to hear at the time. Yeah. So yes, there is definitely a link and, you know, I, I went out for a, a very long walk this morning um, because I must admit there was anxiety about doing this this podcast. Um, and I went for a very long walk and it did bring the anxiety down. But also I have to be aware that there are people for whom that is just not possible for whatever reason. 
Um, so I think that we have to tread very, very carefully in seeing going for a walk or going for a run or whatever it might be as being the, the panacea for, for all mental health issues. But yes, the, the, there is, you know, if, we, um, if we're normally active and then we spend the day because we might feel, you know, we've got cold or COVID or something like that, and we just cannot, we're too ill to get up, then it does bring on our mood as well. Um, and then, as I was just saying, in reverse to that, if our mood is low, it can sometimes be very, very difficult to get the physical um, movement going as well. Absolutely. I, I kind of in the, in the part, say if I train, um, I train quite a bit, but like I have to be aware of the idea of tr like training through it. Like it's it's like not not um taking a step back and going like oh, I'm not actually feeling well today. I'm literally trying to do what I do when I'm feeling good, but it's it's not going to be beneficial to me in the long run. I need to it's yeah. It's just kind of you know having those days where you you know take take stock and kind of go well like maybe i just need to relax today yeah oh absolutely you know that there is there is nothing wrong and i know there's probably a fair few people out there who would tell me again that i'm being hypocritical but there is nothing wrong in having a sofa day mm. you know listen listening to our bodies and listening and okay what does my body need because mental if we have uh, poor mental health it totally drains us as well yeah no, physically. So what does my body need as well as what does my mental health need? Um, otherwise, you know, certainly people, um, I would have clients and they, they would come to me and they would have difficult life circumstances that are going through or, you know, their mental health is weighing them down and they're just plain exhausted. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and I'm, a, a, as I say, I don't live up to it myself all the time. Um, but I, a big believer in, we need to listen, what is it that our body needs? And if it is rest, then we need to rest. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing uh, I wanted to mention to you, Nick, because you've worked, uh, you know, uh, with people with mental health for, for a, a long time now, how do you think we're kind of doing, uh, with regards to mental health in Ireland? You know, you mentioned about schools, TY and stuff, and I don't know, obviously what goes on in schools now, but like, do you think we're it's becoming more and more talked about but do you think there's action being taken well yeah i mean this 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 for me is is the big thing is that you know we're encouraged to talk about our mental health which yes we should but where do we go to talk about it um you, you know that um certainly the public mental health system does leave a lot to be desired it's run very much on on the the kind of medical model which is either medication, and yes, there are times we do need medication. You know, I'm certainly not advocating that people don't take medication for their mental health. There are times when we do need it. Um, but that's not the be all and end all. And certainly what I find is that there's an over-reliance on cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, um, which again is fine, um, I think, for things like, you know, anxiety and stuff like that can be very helpful. But if a client is coming with trauma that is deep-rooted, then maybe that does not, CBT does not fit their, their needs. I know as well that um, certainly the HSC are pushing the online CBT model, which basically is a, you know, you don't see anybody, just questions come up on the screen, you oh. type um, now, I know several people who were um, prescribed that and it, it's actually made them feel worse because they just said, oh, you know, I must be so bad because it's having no effect on me. I need to talk to somebody, um, you know, and I'm again, I'm aware of people who would go through the mental health services, the, the psychiatric services, and it's a different doctor each time. Yep, you know who hasn't probably read the, the 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 person's file, so they have to sit down in a very limited space of time, tell their story again. the The doctor may or may not up or reduce their meds, 
and that's it. There's no kind of, um, there is no kind of proactive, okay, how do we move on from where we are? It's just containment. Now this is, I know this is my, um, my take on it, but, you know, working with clients um, and having friends who are in the mental health, who are clients in the mental health service, you know, this is the message that I'm getting continuously is that the doctor doesn't know who, who I am, that maybe there's a disagreement between diagnosis, that some will increase the meds, some will decrease the meds, but there is no kind of what's the long-term plan here. It is just, okay, we'll see you in six months. And you know that it's not going to be the same doctor again. Yep. Which, which I, I think in, you know, even in this day and age is absolutely abhorrent. The people who are using the mental health services deserve far, far better, far better. It's the very reason, Nick, why I left the the public uh, service, because like you said, every time I went in, it was somebody else and they had a vague idea of what I was diagnosed with or what I wanted to talk about, what I had talked about in the previous and. Uh, that's why I started to go private them because it was just the, 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 there was a sense of like uh, deja vu, like, Oh, here we go again. You know, like that it was going to, if I saw the same person twice in a row, I was like, this is it. Like you get excited. You think now I might have the same person. And then the third time it's not. And it's for the first two years when I really felt low, I was putting up with it because I didn't have the voice to say anything. I was just had to go. And then when I was like, Five years in, I was like, "This, I can't, I can't go on. This isn't good enough," you know. Yeah, exactly. And and you know, if you if you're continuously again, it's about the messages we receive. So the messages, you know, I'm hearing from people are things like, um, "Well, this is all I'm worth." You know, I'm yeah. not important for them to take notice of what my needs are. They just palm me off. It's a tick box exercise. Um, now I know that's sort of how people can view it. But it's very real, you know, and these are the messages that people are getting is that I'm not worth it, you know, that um, I'm not getting what I would like to get or nobody is helping me find what it is that I actually need. They're just shoving more pills down my neck. Um, so I wanted to kind of pick your brain on this a little because uh, you've been there, I've been there. Um, but, you know, the advice that, say, you might give someone who is, I guess, struggling to admit that they need help. Okay. It's okay. So if someone is struggling to admit they need help, uh, and I know I'm turning it back on you mm -hmm. now, are they actually aware that they need help? Yes. Like uh, if I was to say it from my point of view, it's a really good question actually, because uh, like I was coming towards something and I knew that this thing was coming, you know, that kind of a way where, where the, the train is about to crash in a film, you know, that kind of situation. And, um, but I didn't want to admit that that was happening. I knew it was happening. It's a, you know, that kind of contradiction in your head or like almost like the devil and the angel on your shoulders kind of a situation. Yeah, it, it's okay. So I think there's, there's two strands to that. Mm -hmm. There is, if we notice a friend or a loved one, needs help i think you know that we to a certain degree we have to kind of step back because the initial reaction is i want to help this person i want to make everything right for this person now if they're not in that space to acknowledge that themselves then it's going to be very very difficult so i think you know if we are watching somebody close to us who is struggling that we do need to be patient that we do need to be supportive that we do need to kind of plant the idea of maybe let's do this together let's mm -hmm. try and find someone who can help you because if it's a case if the person is resistant and we're saying to them you need help it's just going to push them back even further um if if and it, it does happen i would have clients who would come and either after one or two sessions just say i'm not i no i it's not for me, which is fine because mm -hmm. they might not be ready. And I think, you know, we, we've all experienced this. We go to therapy when we we feel we're ready because if we're not ready to engage, then it's not going to work. So it is very, very difficult. Our natural instinct 
is to want to make that person right. Yeah. Um, but it is about being caring. It is about being compassionate. And it's about um, being patient as well with the individual. Whether, you know, it's me as a therapist with a client. Um, and, you know, I have some clients that I'm doing very long-term work um, with. And it is about that patience and accepting that they're at that place that they're at. And no matter how much I can see, you need to be over here and they're here. I can't make them come here. They can only do it themselves. So it is It is about being patient. And I think that, again, as a wider society, we have, um, we have the responsibility to make it acceptable to go and see someone if I'm mentally ill. You know, and the thing that I would often say is, if you were to break your leg, what would you do? You'd go to a doctor and then to the hospital. Mental health needs to be seen in the same way. If your mental health, I wouldn't say is broken, but if, if you are in poor mental health, then you need to see a specialist who can help you to find your way back again. Absolutely. And there is that disconnect between, you know, yeah, of course I would go to the doctors if I broke my leg, but go to a therapist. Mm. Yeah, there, <laughs> there's a massive disconnect between it. Before I ask you what you do in your spare time, Nick, there's something I didn't mention at the start of this. You're the first father and uh, who had a son on the, the podcast. Uh, and I checked this just to make sure I got it right. It was episode 136 that Killian was on, so over a year now. Um, Ireland's, is he Ireland's strongest man now? He, he is Ireland's strongest man. He's probably going to kick me because there's probably some weird thing that says, no, it's only in such and such a thing. But mm. I know that, you know, like with, with boxing, there's the different bodies and things yeah. like that. So, so don't ask me which body it is. But anyway, he certainly is. He can use the title Ireland's Strongest Man. Um, I think he's doing another Strongest Man on the 4th of November. Okay. Belfast, if I remember rightly. Um, and he, he does the UK as well. Mm. Very strongest Man. He goes over there. And, you know, he's only been doing it a few years now. Um, and he's only, Jesus, I don't know how old he is now. He's about, he's mid twenties anyway, um, 26, something like that. Um, you know, and, and to achieve what he has achieved is, is tremendous, you know, and I suppose yeah. I acknowledge the other two as well, because otherwise I'll end up with a black eye, but you know, um, you know, the, the James, the youngest, he's, a, 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 you know, a, I wouldn't say a leading light, but he's big in the, in the field of jujitsu. Oh, and good. He, fights in tournaments um and danielle my oldest she was at one stage before she had the baby was ireland's second strongest woman <laughs> oh so, yeah so when when they get fed up with that i said i'm going to run a security firm with three of them. it's a, it's certainly a physical family it's it's because uh, i know when killian was on nick he, he was officially titled the second the strongest man in ireland i'm, I'm not saying the podcast takes it takes like you know um, any kind of tick for for him becoming the strongest since, but I will say that we did have someone come on the Tyrone goalkeeper Niall Morgan, and he did then win the All Ireland the following year. So I'm not saying it's because of the podcast, but I'm saying maybe. But I, the thing about it, uh, Nick, I might have met James before or definitely seen him compete because I would go to jiu jitsu competitions and have a look. So I might have even seen him compete. So um, now having said all that, Nick, right? So we've we talked about jiu jitsu and and strong men, strong women. Uh, what do you like to do in your spare time? Oh, um, I do photography. Yes. Um, not the sort of the chocolate box uh, type of photography. Mine's quite sort of dark, a lot of black and white stuff um, with a lot of dark shadows um, and things like that. Um, so people have said that it's almost as if you're looking at the picture and there's something slightly off camera that is a bit disturbing that's about to enter the frame. Um, so I, I I do that and I find that that helps in my mental health because it, it, you literally focus, you know, if if I'm walking along and I've got my camera, I'm focusing on what it is, yeah. that, you know, does this look good? Does this feel right? Um, and I'm going to take the photo. So um, that, that would be a big thing. I probably ha recently haven't been do doing enough of it. Um, but I do do that. I'm also a huge fan of horror films. 
Um, you know, I, I'm talking the real, you know, the really good horror film. Yes. Or Exorcist. I do like the the old sort of retro 1970s, the original Halloween, um, Friday the 13th, that sort of stuff. Um, I always say I look at it from a cinematographic point of view because, you know, that that kind of, whether it's Technicolor or whatever it is, there's an awful lot of black, mm. the night shots with these bright kind of neon lights, which is what I would try to, to get in me photography. Um, if I, when I do color shots as well, but yeah, horror films, I, I do try and watch a horror film a night. I, I look, we're on the same page with this, Nick, right? Because I love horror films and Halloween's my favorite horror film. Uh, but I would like, looking at your photography, actually, this is like a bit of a take, but like it reminded me of the kind of those old expressionist German films from like the 20s and 30s. You know, the kind of the idea that I go for like the, the old, like you mentioned about shadows and stuff like that. But there was something really cool about those films because they would use kind of cardboard cutouts to create like shadows. That's what your um photography uh, reminded me of. If, if that's a compliment, I think it is. Absolutely. And and also, if you go into the sort of the, um, um, oh, I can't think of his name now, the famous Scandinavian director, whose name escapes me now, um, whose name is the same, surname is the same. Bergman. As- Bergman. Yeah, yeah, that's it. If you look at some of his, um, or even some of the earlier uh, Francois Truffaut, the black, mm. there is that kind of starkness um there's a very good film actually on youtube um it's it's a film of a uh, mr james not the rap singer but mr james the author um who is called whistle and i come to you i think it is oh uh, I, you know that yeah no it's it's in today's horror it's it hasn't got all the special effects mm. but it's in black and white and there's a scene on the beach in suffolk and it is just ah. Uh, unbelievable you've just got this figure in the distance coming towards you type of thing and it's all black and white and it is very very stark contrast so yeah it's it's i i I appreciate that what you said there because that is kind of like the thing that i try to um try to emulate well um the next question hopefully people can go and look at your photos uh where can people find you nick um personally um well i i'm based in county mayo Mm -hmm. Uh, I work between my private practice, um, which the majority of work I do still is online. Yeah. I think we had to have a shift during COVID as therapists. Um, so a lot of stuff did move online and I still do a significant of my own private work online as well as in here as well. Um, but I also work at the Knock Counseling Centre. Okay. In Mayo as well, which is a, a low cost uh, counseling service. Um, which is which is very very good, um, and I, I feel privileged to actually be be part of that. Absolutely. Where can they see your photos? Where can they see my photos? Um, if you go on to either Instagram, mm-hmm. Nick at When Fog Clears, I think yep. it is, or if not, just have a look at Nick Groom Photography on Facebook. Um, mm-hmm. And if anyone is interested, I'm sure we can do a deal if they quote your podcast. Absolutely. Now we're talking and uh, now we're doing business here, Nick. But Nick, um, listen, uh, you've been a fantastic guest. I appreciate all your honesty and uh, helping us understand some of it. And also, you know, the positivity of therapy and going to therapy. Very important. Absolutely. And and I think the thing to remember, remember is as well, you know, we're not always as you might picture in, in terms of what is you see on the film, you know, sit there with a suit and tie and, uh, you know, the the notepad writing everything down. We're not all like that. You know, I, yeah. I'm quite relaxed in my approach. Um, I think humour plays a good part in the therapy, it, as long as it's appropriate. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it's... The majority of us are, you know, very authentic. We are who we are. Yeah. Type of thing. Um, and I think that message needs to be got across to, to take the fear mm. out of going and finding a therapist. And if you go see Nick, you will see him every week. He will not disappear for four weeks and then come back the next week. But that's enough about that. I won't rant about that. But listen, Nick, stick with me for two seconds uh, and I'll finish this out. I also want to say a big thank you to John Francis for always doing the tech for me. I always thank my mom and dad, my granddad, Jern Calvin, for obvious reasons. Um, 
we're on YouTube. Subscribe if you would. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And then, oh, well, it's called X now, whatever. And then it's uh, Spotify, Apple, Anchor, Google Podcasts, etc. Once again, Nick, thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And thanks to everyone for watching. Uh, and we'll see you next week. Bye.